Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about the uh, what was the focal point of my, my master's research, and that is tactics for overcoming uh, political opposition to infill housing and policy recommendations for legalizing missing middle housing forms um, in established uh, single family dominated suburban neighborhoods. All right, so um, although Nat sort of covered off on this earlier, um, let's do a, a little refresher on what we're talking about with mi missing middle housing and uh, soft densification. So this, uh, this differs from more obvious forms of densification that we see in a lot of Canadian cities today, uh, which is the construction of apartments and condos along sort of main arterial roads in, in mall parking lots, um, other sort of easy, um, easily developable parcels that don't usually run into too much political opposition. Uh, soft densification, in contrast, tends to be smaller scale, more incremental uh, form of densification and can often be undertaken on a single lot as opposed to uh, consolidated lots, increasing the number of units from say one or two on a, on a lot to three or four. So these uh, soft densification measures can supplement the higher density projects that tend to be built in the more politically easy locations like those arterial roads and they provide family size ground oriented housing typologies that blend more contextually into existing uh, built fabric of um, established neighborhoods. So uh, an example of the, the sort of mix of housing types that we're talking about with soft densification or missing middle uh, are shown on this slide. So as you can see, this sort of gives, um, gives some of those advanced uh, examples and shows how they can carefully be weaved into the fabric of existing lower density neighborhoods without really causing too much of a um, of, a, of an abrupt change in scale. Just a quick overview of some of the common typologies um, that we generally see with, uh, with missing middle or soft densification. Um, so these are usually, as I said before, um, housing typologies that can be built on maybe one or two lots. Uh, so the, the, the smallest scale, uh, we tend to see basement suites or accessory dwelling units, uh, such as laneway houses or backyard cottages. And at the higher end of the density scale, you can get um, plexes uh, or cottage clusters or courtyard apartments. Um, so these are generally small sets of cottages or two to three story apartment buildings um, of relatively low density, maybe five, six, seven units uh, built in a U shape, generally around an interior open green space courtyard that sort of acts as a, as a front yard facing the street. Um, and an example of a cottage cluster is shown on the, um, the bottom uh, picture there on this slide. So with my research, I looked at uh, three different case studies of cities um, that have implemented soft densification infill housing strategies in existing uh, predominantly single family home neighborhoods um, that already have existing infrastructure such as roads, schools and parks. Uh, most of these were on the West Coast where uh, quite a few of these um, infill housing strategies have taken off. Uh, generally due to the, the extremely high cost of living, which is now unfortunately becoming a national issue as well. So the first case study that I looked at was in Kelowna, British Columbia, and that was um, a new zone called the RU7 zone. And this is an infill zone that permits versatile infill housing types um, that are generally two to four units per infill lot, depending on the, uh, the width of the lot. Um, as I said, the housing forms are versatile in this zone, and so they can range from detached buildings, so I think three or four small side-by-side um, -side units um, with their own private outdoor space, or a single building with four units arranged side-by-side -side or, or back-to-back. Um, second case study that I looked at was in Seattle, uh, Washington, and that was their mandatory housing affordability program. Um, this is part of a larger initiative to mandate affordable housing in the city. And as part of that, they increase density on single family lots in many of the city's neighborhoods. So in some, some of the single family neighborhoods, about 10% of the, the neighborhoods in the city, they increase to allow higher ranges of densities, um, such as uh, larger plexes or small apartment buildings. And the remaining single family neighborhoods were rezoned to allow for up to three units per lot. Uh, and finally, uh, I looked at Portland's residential infill program. And this, uh, this program allows for up to four homes to be built across uh, single family lots through most of the city um, and essentially has legalized duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, uh, cottage clusters in, in almost all residential areas. So through, uh, through my research, I, I did interviews with residents of these cities, uh, talked to planners and did an, an analysis of public hearing feedback 
that was received while these policies and programs were being drafted. Uh, and I assessed the common concerns that I heard from residents um, to the densification of, of their established single family neighborhoods and looked at uh, how policies can be tailored to achieve housing targets while overcoming these resident concerns. So some of the common concerns um, that I heard uh, can be generally grouped in, in the sort of following broad categories. So I think first and foremost, um, and I don't think it's a surprise to too many people, the, uh, the concern of aesthetic character or the neighborhood character comes up a lot. So that can be you know, the look or quality of new infill buildings, uh, incongruity between modern architecture and pre-existing architecture, uh, the loss of heritage or, or character homes, um, the scale, uh, bulk and size of new infill buildings as they relate to the pre-existing scale of, of buildings in the neighborhood. Uh, residents also express concerns about home values. Uh, this is, I think, harder to deal with through, through policy um, and can kind of solve itself. Um, often, you know, if density is increased on, on a lot, the, the value of that lot um, will often increase as well. Um, there's uh, a lot of concern also through the loss of amenity. Um, so by amenity, I mean the, the loss of green space that often characterizes lower density neighborhoods. And this is usually made up through the front yards of neighboring houses um as well as um you know the views that people get uh of of the green space and and potential diminished access to light from, from larger buildings um residents uh also expressed concerns about um the development community and mistrust of developers um and and worried that uh these upzonings in these neighborhoods were, were simply handouts uh to the development community and lastly um but very importantly there were concerns about the loss of affordable housing and gentrification as a result of upzoning and infill uh, housing, and in particular, uh, the loss of affordable rentals. So, uh, of course, not all of these concerns can be addressed um, through policy, um, and you know, not all not all concerns should be addressed. But I think that uh, those concerns that can be balanced with the creation of new housing. Um, and when those concerns can be incorporated into any upzoning legislation, it can help to ensure that aspects of neighborhoods that residents value uh, remain even after densities are increased. And this can make these upzoning initiatives much more politically palatable. So one of the primary concerns that I heard, um, as, as I mentioned earlier, was that infill housing would change the look and feel of a neighborhood. Uh, and I think, you know, this makes sense when, when people buy a home, they're investing in their neighborhood um, and they, they feel like they have quite a stake in it. Um, so, of course, the addition of new housing will bring some change, but that change doesn't necessarily have to dramatically alter a neighborhood's built form. So density can come in, you know, many shapes and sizes. And I think the key is finding the right contextual fit for each neighborhood. So in, so one of the, uh, the most important aspects I think to consider in terms of, of, the, of the neighborhood character is the existing condition of the neighborhood. Um, you know, what are, what are the existing building heights and what is proposed for infill? So for example, in uh, the Kelowna case study, there are U7 zone uh, limits building heights to 2.5 stories. And this is because the existing homes in most of the neighborhoods slated to receive the infill density were generally uh, one and a half to two stories tall. Uh, this is a bit of an artifact of the neighborhood's historical development, uh, generally being summer cottages or orchard workers' cottages. And as a result, a four-story building would stand out a lot more in these neighborhoods um, than, say, if the existing uh, built form was generally three-story homes. So, you know, as a counter example of, um, and, and just to uh, point out on the slide, here are the, here are two examples of the um, housing typologies built in that RU7 zone. And as you can see there, they're, although they fit four units on a single lot, they are generally not that tall. They're about uh, two, two and a half stories. Um, and uh, it, as a sort of counterpoint to that, uh, Winnipeg, Manitoba, they, um, they also had an infill housing program more in, in small lot uh, single family developments. And there was quite a backlash to the building heights in those zones, which um, led to petitions um, among neighborhood residents to stop building infill housing altogether. And ultimately the, the building heights had to be addressed uh, down the road, but not after making some enemies along the way. 
Um, another uh, fear that I heard quite often, um, and this was especially the case in, in Seattle and, and Portland, was the loss of older homes or, or character homes that people value in their neighborhoods. Um, so in Seattle, where the concerns over the loss of older uh, homes was quite prevalent, um, heritage retention bonuses were implemented into their mandatory housing affordability program. So a developer or builder who preserves uh, a heritage home qualifies for a 50% exemption of the floor area limit of the infill housing, meaning that they're allowed more total density uh, than if the dwelling is demolished and entirely replaced. Um, and the image on this slide gives an example of, of how these retention bonuses work. Uh, this one is, is actually from Vancouver, but the principle remains the same. Um, so, you know, if an older home is retained, uh, additional density can be granted onto the site um, in sort of diverse set of ways. It can either be through the construction of uh, infill dwellings in the back, such as a laneway home, or um, the conversion of the existing house into multiple uh, units. So one of the other um, sort of broad categories of negative comments that, that I heard uh, was a general fear of the loss of valued green space that uh, lower density um, single family neighborhoods uh, offer. Particularly the, the front yards that buffer homes from one another, provide green space onto the street and uh, buffer homes from the street. So I think often when people hear density, they, you know, their mind jumps to say the Plateau or, or Griffin Town, um, which are, you know, great neighborhoods, but not everyone wants that for their own neighborhood. And I think density can be increased while still maintaining a context sensitive landscape and green space. It doesn't have to look like an, uh, you know, a central urban neighborhood. And, you know, that's a lot of the reason why people move to, to suburban neighborhoods, because they do like that, that, that green space that they get in their own front yard without even having to go to a park. So in, there are ways to address this, um, and in Seattle, uh, the upzoning of their single family neighborhoods was guided by the principle of maintaining publicly visible green space and not altering that landscape too much. So the legislation did it in several ways. Uh, first, it maintained lot coverage limits of 50% and uh, front and rear setbacks of three, uh, three to five meters with, with side yard setbacks of about one and a half meters. So this left considerable open space in the yards, um, quite comparable to the existing condition of these neighborhoods. Uh, this allows new infill development to fit much more contextually in with surrounding single family homes. And uh, it also promotes um, uh, planted areas in the new developments that, that recreate the, the look and feel of a front yard. Um, to ensure a, an appropriate amount of attractive green space is provided in these setback areas, uh, they also require um, that trees on site, especially mature uh, coniferous trees, be retained or um, that uh, they be replaced often with a two or three to one ratio so that, you know, the loss of a mature tree um, will create um, three smaller trees, which is unfortunate, but ultimately will grow to be, um, you know, a, a, a landscape sort of characteristic of what was there before. Um, another uh, set of recommendations that I heard, especially talking to senior planners, was that one of the best ways to alleviate concerns that residents have about densification is to provide opportunities for them to take part in it themselves and to capitalize on the increase in density in their neighborhood. So a key to this is to allow for more streamlined development processes and avoiding requiring uh, lot consolidation. So often for small scale builders or homeowners, um, who may want to profit off the additional density that's now available on their lots, lot consolidation is out of reach. And similarly, city development processes can be unwieldy um, and hard to navigate, uh, navigate for, for less experienced builders. This leaves out uh, generally all but most the, the most established developers and builders. And it's, it's also a, um, it's a, it's an issue that can be overcome uh, through the proper shaping of legislation. So, in the Kelowna RU7 example, uh, the policy was adopted um, through a design competition that allowed for the creation of prototype designs for infill housing, all of which could be built on a single unconsolidated standard size lot in uh, the existing single family neighborhoods. 
And any builder who or resident who selects those prototypes are able to um, avoid the development permit process at the city. So the approvals process for building one of these prototype designs is two to three weeks as opposed to um, six months or more. Uh, Los Angeles has recently adopted a similar measure. Um, they chose 20 pre-designed uh, accessory dwelling unit backyard cottages that are pre-approved to be built in backyards without having to go through a rigorous um, regulatory process. Uh, and the image here is one of those uh, prototypes for Los Angeles. Um, one other good strategy for sort of starting to introduce infill housing in established neighborhoods um, is to start slowly and to build off of what already exists. So in discussions with one of the, the senior planners in Kelowna, I was told that that building off of uh, the existing um, allowance of carriage houses or basement suites got people accustomed to more housing diversity and mixes of tenures in their uh, neighborhoods. And that allowed for larger scale interventions, uh, such as the RU7 zone that um, allows for up to four units per lot. Uh, the, the final concern that was heard quite uh, common um, is the concern of displacement and the loss of affordability. So although that the intent of increasing density in single family neighborhoods is to create more affordable and family sized housing, there can be valid concerns that upzoning can lead to displacement and uh, especially the displacement of renters. But ultimately, upzoning doesn't have to equal gentrification. And this can be alleviated in, in a number of ways. So in Seattle, their upzoning legislation attempted to balance the increase in density with the limitation of displacement impacts by targeting larger density increases in areas with high access to transit and amenities, but low displacement risk. So they looked at categories um, such as more affluent neighborhoods uh, for higher increases in, in, in density and in less wealthy neighborhoods uh, and those with larger minority populations, less aggressive zoning changes were made. Uh, Portland went sort of with a different tactic and they offered density bonusing um, in their residential infill project for affordable housing. So if a builder wants to make half of the units in an infill development affordable, uh, the density allowance of the infill increases uh, from four units up to up to six per lot. Um, in other uh, cases, um, for example, in Vancouver, density increases through infill are tied to expanding the rental pool. So uh, Vancouver's laneway program um, has led to the construction of several thousand laneway homes uh, across the city. Um, and all of these laneway homes are and cannot be sold. So it's it's allowed individual homeowners to build a third um, unit on their lot if they already have a secondary suite in their basement, um, also to be rented out. Just uh, so I'll just wrap up. Oh, OK, <laughs> sorry, I was going to say one minute left. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, no worries. It's wrapping up with a few key takeaways. Um, so I think one of the, the core takeaways is that each of the three pieces of, of legislation that I looked at in each of these case studies, um, they, they all actively engaged residents early on in the process and that allowed them to understand those resident concerns and ultimately take some of those concerns and adopt them into the legislation. Uh, additionally, understanding you know, what residents value about their, their neighborhoods allows for more context sensitive infill strategies um, as there's no one size fits all solution to infill density, um, you know, it can be as small as a laneway house or a secondary suite or larger, such as um, a cottage cluster. And ultimately, context is key. Uh, determining the right housing typologies, the right fit for density and the right, the right building heights and, and setbacks um, can be understood after uh, thorough um, engagement with, with residents. Uh, and lastly, um, the more that regulations can be streamlined, um, the more likely that a program will find success and the more that it can be open to smaller scale builders, uh, mom and pop builders, as opposed to simply large developers, then the, the higher uptake you tend to uh, find.